So this morning, the title of our Bible lesson is Jesus, our perfect Savior. We might also entitle this Jesus, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And we can well imagine that everything that God does is perfect. If God is the one sending Jesus to be our Savior, and if Jesus is God, everything that God the Father does, everything that Jesus does, must be perfect. And it must show and exude all of the wisdom of Almighty God. So I have a number of points this morning. I just want us to reflect and to meditate on how wonderful our Savior is. He's a perfect Savior. He's the Savior that we need. And I hope we can appreciate the wonderful salvation that we have in Christ Jesus more than ever. So we'll go through these points one by one. And I have about two scripture references for each point, or if I have more than two, uh, they'll, be, they'll be in the same book. So hopefully we can follow along if you'd like to. I know some like to jot the references down. But number one, Jesus is our perfect Savior because he is a God-ordained Savior. In other words, God planned in eternity to provide for us salvation. He planned to provide us a Savior. It's not like Jesus came to earth to visit us on earth and Jesus had no intention to go into the cross and somehow everything just spun out of control and God was caught off guard and his son was crucified. No, it didn't happen that way at all. So if we're in Isaiah 53, this was written about 700 years before the coming of Christ. And I simply share this one prophecy from the Old Testament just to underscore the point that God had in mind all along to send his son, to send the Messiah for Israel and for the world, and that this Messiah would be crucified. If you're there now in Isaiah 53, notice verse 4. Surely he, that is Jesus the Messiah, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That really sounds to me like Jesus being our substitute. Jesus enduring the penalty for our sins that we rightfully deserved. But the penalty instead fell on Jesus. What an amazing prophecy. Again, it was prophesied about 700 years before the coming of Christ. And it was fulfilled so accurately. Good news for us. Our sins have been paid in full. If you will, let's go to the Acts passages. So if you will, fast forward to the New Testament and we come to Acts. So the Isaiah passage took us back to the Old Testament before Christ came. Now the Acts passage takes us beyond the coming of Christ and his crucifixion. So these passages are looking back at the crucifixion. The Isaiah passage looked forward to the crucifixion now the Acts passages will look back after the crucifixion has happened. So let's go to Acts chapter 2. And here Peter is giving his sermon on the day of Pentecost, explaining what is happening, and he's going to preach Jesus to the people gathered in Jerusalem. So in this uh, sermon of Peter, we get down to verse 23. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 23. And Peter says, Him, referring to Jesus the Messiah, being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Here we are reminded that what happened at the cross, when Jesus was taken, when Jesus was crucified, was not some event spinning out of control. No, everything was under God's perfect control, 
And God allowed his son to be crucified because God wanted his son to be the payment for our sins. So that God can be absolutely just. Our sins have been paid for. And God can be loving and merciful and send to us his forgiveness. If you will, flip the page and go to Acts 4. Acts chapter 4. Peter and John had just appeared before the religious authorities, and the religious authorities are telling Peter and John, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Of course, those disciples aren't going to listen. Of course, they're going to go out and speak in the name of Jesus. And so Peter and John go back to their own company, and they have a prayer meeting. And in this prayer of the early church that they lift up to God, this is what they say in verse 27. This is Acts 4, verse 27. Uh, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So the cross of Christ was part of God's plan. It was not a situation spinning out of God's control. It's not like God lost control of the situation. And then he had to pull off a last-minute resurrection to bring his son back. No, no. God had it all planned, all in mind, that his son, Jesus the Messiah, the King of Israel, would be crucified for us and our sins. So we have a God-ordained, a God-appointed Savior. Number two. Jesus is a willing Savior. In other words, Jesus didn't go to the cross against his will. He wasn't forced to go. He went willingly because he knew he was doing the will of the Father. And Jesus came with a passion to do his Father's will. And his Father's will was his will. By the way, there's a good lesson there for us. If Jesus, the eternal Son of God, was on earth and had no greater passion than to do his Father's will, then we are inspired likewise to follow the example of Jesus and have a passion to do our Father's will. All right, so we have John chapter 10 here. The Gospel of John chapter 10. So let me go back to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 10. And we recognize this passage as the passage where Jesus affirms that he is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. So in the Gospel of John chapter 10, let's notice verse 17, if you will. John chapter 10 and verse 17. Jesus says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So it sounds like Jesus is willingly, voluntarily laying down his life as a sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus also has the power to take up his life again in resurrection glory. If we have, uh, we have one other passage here, Philippians 2. Uh, Philippians 2 and verses 5 to 8. Remember, this passage is the passage where... Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks about our attitude, uh, the mind, the mind of Christ that should be in us. So in Philippians 2, I'll just read this, Philippians 2, verses eight, uh, 5 to 8, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus willingly, of his own free choice, uh, wanted to obey God the Father, and so much so that he was willing to be obedient even to the point of death, and not just any death, but by the death of crucifixion. Even by the horrors and the agony and the pain and the suffering of crucifixion, Jesus willingly, voluntarily, freely went to the cross for you 
and for me. And this leads me to my next point, number three. We have a loving Savior. A loving Savior. Truly, our Savior is perfect. And the sacrifice Jesus made for us is perfect. Hence, we have a perfect, full, complete, wonderful salvation because of Christ. And so we can think of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. I think many of us know this, but God demonstrates. He shows his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If we weren't sinners, Christ wouldn't need to die for us, but because we're all sinners, the whole human race is sinful. Christ freely, willingly died for us to show us and to reveal the awesome love of God. When we think about what God is doing for us in Christ, Jesus truly is the supreme revelation of God's love. And then if you will, maybe we can all turn to this one. 1 John 4. 1 John 4. Let's go to 1 John 4. This passage also speaks uh, to God's great love revealed in Christ. 1 John chapter 4. And as we think about the love, the love of God revealed in Jesus, even the love of Jesus himself, I want us to think about how great that love is. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all have a hard time wrapping our mind around the, 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 the wonder, the power, the intensity, the magnificence of God's love for us. God's love for unworthy and undeserving sinners. And we learn how to love from God. God is not up in heaven looking down at us human beings on earth. And God is not saying as he looks at earth, boy, are these people on earth, they just love each other so much. God doesn't say, well, so I'm going to learn how to love from these people on earth because they're all doing such a great job loving. No, 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 it's the other way around. God looks at earth and sees our sin, our evil, our vice, our cruelty, our wickedness, our iniquities. And God sends his son into this world to reveal his love. God shows us his love so that we can look at God and what God did for us in Christ and we can learn how to love from God, because God is love, and he has shown love to us. We know how to love. We know what love is by looking at God. God does not look at us and learn how to love. We look at God and learn how to love from him. All right, 1 John chapter 4, notice verse 9. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifest, in other words, was shown, was revealed, was disclosed toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Notice that God's love is, is determined to do something good for us, something beneficial, that we might live, that we might live in union with God, that we might live and have fellowship with God. And notice that God's love is active. God sent, he did something. He sent his son into what? The world, this sin-sick world, this hostile world, this world that was arrayed against the plans and the purposes of God and quite ignorant of God. That's the world into which God sent his son. Now verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is good. God is loving. God's love is active, it's powerful, it comes to our aid, it comes to our rescue. And again, I repeat for emphasis, the supreme revelation, the great revelation of God's love is found in Jesus. If Jesus didn't come, if the Son of God did not become human and live among us, we would not understand or appreciate the love of God like we do today because of the revelation of Jesus. I'll come back a little later at another point and discuss propitiation and what that means for us. But we have a loving Savior. Number four, we have a sinless Savior. This explains how it is that Jesus can help us. He's absolutely sinless. He's not only the eternal Son of God, but he's also sinless. I suppose he's sinless because he is the eternal Son of God. So I have two references here. You want to go to Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews, just back up a little bit if you're in 1 John. Just back up a little bit to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. 
and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. So here the writer uh, to the Hebrews says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. What the writer is saying here is we do in fact have a high priest who can sympathize with us, who can empathize with us with all of our faults and failures. Not because he sinned, but he entered into our world of humanity. He suffered pain and tiredness, and he went to the cross. He knew what it was like to die, not just die a death from, say, old age, or die a death from disease, or die a death from an accident, but Jesus died a very painful and horrific death that was intentional, and it was by execution, and it was meant to be painful. So yes, Jesus can sympathize with all of our weaknesses because he assumed a human body and he lived among us as a human body, being fully God and fully human. That's the high priest that we have. Yet he was without sin. Praise the Lord. He can help us because he's not a sinner like us. One other reference here, 1 Peter. So if you just keep going over in your New Testament, just go past James and we're right in 1 Peter. Just go past James and we're in 1 Peter. And I'll begin in verse 18. This is chapter 1, chapter 1 and verse 18 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. And so much of what Peter says in his letter is designed to inspire us to persevere in our faith in Christ. We have a wonderful future, and Jesus has fully secured our salvation by his death on the cross for us. So notice verse 18. And knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus is the lamb of God, that final all-sufficient sacrifice for our sins that is perfect. No blemish, no defect, no fault, no failure. No shortcoming, whatever, in the eyes of God. So our Savior who went to the cross for us was a sinless Savior. All right, point number five. He is our substitute. He was there in my place, in your place. Uh, we already alluded to this in the Isaiah 53 passage. But let's look at uh, some passages here in 1 Peter. You're already in 1 Peter. So if you will, just look it over, over in chapter 2, if you will. 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's just start with verse 23. This is chapter 2, verse 23. Who, when he, that is Jesus, was reviled, he did not revile in return. In other words, when he was insulted, he did not insult back. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And by the way, that's how we all ought to live our lives. Committing ourselves to God. Committing our life, our present, our future, all that we are, all that we have, into the hands of God. Now verse 24. Referring to Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, should live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Notice those words here. Peter is very clear, very direct, and right to the point. Jesus was there on the cross, not because of his sins, but he was there. He bore, he carried, he endured the penalty that I deserve, that you deserve, that we deserve for what our sins, the sins that we committed. And it says that he himself bore our sins in his own body. It's as if to remind us that Jesus did feel all of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the agony, all of the misery of that fateful day when he was nailed to a cross and crucified. And then if you will, just flip the page and let's notice chapter 3 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're thinking now that Jesus is our substitute. He was there in my place and in your place. Enduring what we deserve. He didn't deserve death. After all, in our scripture reading, Pilate made it clear. I find no fault in this man. I find no fault at all. You take him, you crucify him, but I find nothing worthy of death. Now notice here chapter 3, verse 18. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins. And we know it was not for his sins, we know it was for our sins. Jesus suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Jesus is the just one, we are all the unjust. So Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So who is the one that brings us to God? Jesus does. Jesus brings me to God the Father. And when Jesus brings me to God the Father, the Father can't say no. The Father will not say no to his beloved, precious Son, who paid for all of our sins. The Father will surely accept you and me. We don't go alone. We don't go begging for mercy by ourselves. Jesus brings us to God the Father, and the Father accepts us. I might just point out in that verse, verse 18, it says that Christ suffered once. Why did Christ suffer just once? Once for our sins? Because he only needed to suffer once. This leads me to my next point, number six. Jesus is a sufficient Savior. He's a sufficient Savior. He only needed to suffer once because his death and his sacrifice on the cross was sufficient. It was enough. It was adequate to satisfy God's demands that our sins be judged and punished and that God upholds his righteousness and his justice. So I have a couple of references here. If you're there in 1 Peter, just keep going over in your New Testament just a little further. Go past 2 Peter and we come to 1 John again. We're in 1 John. 1 John. By the way, we just have seven points, so we're at point number six. We'll have one more point after this. We have a sufficient Savior. I think of that hymn we sang earlier, It is enough that Jesus died, and then he died for me. Why is it enough? Because the sacrifice in his death was sufficient. That's all I need. All I need to do is just trust in Jesus, who paid it all for me, and then all my sins will be forgiven. So now if you're in 1 John, let's notice chapter 2, if you will. 1 John chapter 2, and we'll just notice verses 1 and 2. So here we read, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself, that's Jesus himself, is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here we have that big word, propitiation. I'm sure you use that word every day, right? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> So propitiation, what does that mean? The essential meaning of propitiation is satisfaction. Jesus is the satisfying payment. He satisfies God the Father. God the Father is satisfied. He's pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. And we know what the Bible says, all who put their faith and trust in Christ, our sins are forgiven. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, with which God is pleased, God is satisfied, we're able to avert and avoid the wrath and the judgment of God on our sins. So that allows the Apostle Paul to say in Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So in summary, Jesus that is that satisfying thing. God is satisfied, God is pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus that allows us unworthy and undeserving sinners to avoid and avert God's wrath and God's judgment on our sins. If you will, flip the page and we'll come back to chapter 4. This is our second round or our second time looking at chapter 4 of uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, we read this earlier, 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. So let's look at verse 10 again. Here we have that word propitiation again. So in chapter 4, verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, to be what? The propitiation for our sins, to be that satisfying payment for our sins that pleases God the Father so that his justice is satisfied and we're able to avoid and avert God's judgment on our sins. Wow, we have a perfect Savior. And what he did for us on the cross is sufficient for all eternity forever and ever and ever and ever and ever to satisfy God's justice that our sins have been paid and paid for 
fully and completely. He's the propitiation for our sin. Remember we read earlier in 1 Peter chapter 2 that Jesus himself, he bore, he carried our sins in his own body in the tree. I would presume that verse means that he carried all of our sins in his body in the tree. The verse doesn't say, well, some of our sins or most of our sins or a few of our sins. We would certainly surmise it's all of our sins that Jesus paid for in full. And one final point this morning, Jesus is a victorious Savior. He's a victorious Savior. He didn't just go to the cross and pay for our sins and, well, that's the end, and Jesus is still in the grave and Jesus is still dead. No. He came back from the dead to live for us, to continue to show his great love for us, and to continue his work as our perfect heavenly Savior. Two final references here, and they're both in Hebrew, so I invite you just to back up a little bit in your New Testament. If you will, go back. And we'll just consider these final two references. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. We'll start in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Hebrews opens with a reminder of the uh, greatness of Jesus. It reminds us of the supremacy of Jesus. There's no one like Jesus. He is the Son of God. And he is uh, superior to angels. So notice, if you will, Hebrews 1 and verse 3, referring to Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, that's God's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Notice it's not his sins, it's our sins. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. That verse implies and alludes to the resurrection of Jesus and his exaltation to the right hand of God the Father. We have a victorious Savior who not only died and paid for our sins, but was raised again from the dead. And one final reference, if you're there in Hebrews, please look at chapter 7, if you will. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. And this verse reminds us very powerfully so that our salvation is secure. It's 100% secure forever. Not because of me or my attempts to try to live a, a Christ-like life, although I should do that. My salvation is not secure because I spend so much time reading the Bible and praying. My salvation is not secure because I try to live a good life, although I should do that. My salvation is secure, and it's 100% secure because of what Jesus has done for me and is now doing for me. Notice this verse. Hebrews 7, verse 25, Therefore he, Jesus, our Savior, is also able to save to the uttermost. That word uttermost means completely, for all time, forever. Jesus, my Savior, is also able to save to the uttermost, or completely, those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is alive. He's at the right hand of God the Father as my representative, as my defense lawyer, you might say. And so as we've reflected on all of these verses and all of these passages this morning, I just want to emphasize we have a perfect Savior. And we have a perfect salvation because it was wrought by a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May God fill me and fill you with the joy of his salvation and may we realize once again it's not about me or my works or my achievements it's all about him it's all about Jesus our Savior. And let me just close with a few lines from the hymns. There's so many wonderful hymns in our hymn book that speak so much to the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf but let me just close with two stanzas uh, one comes from the hymn, And Can It Be? And I'll just refer to the first stanza. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die? for me.
And one other hymn, it's uh, My Savior's Love, I'll just refer to the third stanza, My Savior's Love, goes like this. He took, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's pray. Lord God, we're reminded that Jesus went to the cross willingly, freely, according to your plan and your purpose to save me, to save us from our sins and all of the ill effects and all of the consequences for our sins and our rebellion against you. So Lord, just help me to appreciate that great display of love as never before. And Lord, help me to rest, rest completely and be secure in the work of Jesus that he accomplished on my behalf. Lord, it's not about us. It's not about our works or our achievements. It's not about us trying to be good, even though as Christians we should try to be good as, our, as, as a show of our love for you, Lord, but it's all about Jesus. It's what he did for me. It's what he did for us. So Lord, help us just to cling to the cross in faith trusting that the salvation we have from a perfect Savior is a perfect salvation. Bless us with the knowledge of your word. Bless us with the knowledge of sins forgiven. Fill us with joy and peace in our Savior. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.